Good evening. Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for uh, the 24th of January. Uh, we will, as usual, sing uh, four songs and have a couple of prayers, and I will deliver a lesson that uh, hopefully uh, will be uplifting to all of us and uh, that uh, we can all benefit from. We'll be singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, and so if you would like to sing along with us, please turn your songbooks to number 77. Hymn number 77. <clears throat> Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the Great. If you would please turn your songbooks to number 185. 185. <clears throat> Jesus, thy name I love. Love that I 
286. <clears throat> Let's sing verses 1 and 3, please. 1 and 3 of 286. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love, 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 Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love. For all the pure and blessed, rest in the mansions above us, with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this short amount of time that we have. Howbeit, uh, we're not together physically, but uh, virtually, but we still have this time together uh, that we can spend praising your name offering prayers, petitions, uh, thanksgiving to you, and then uh, getting into your word and uh, trying to find something in it and glean something from it that will be useful to us through the evening and something to ponder through the week. As we look at our bulletins, we see so many in our prayer list. We're grateful that uh, Natalie has, has uh, uh, on the road to recovery as she battled the COVID uh, I pray that you would continue to be with Alan Crabb as he has been in and out of the hospital with pneumonia. I pray also that you would uh, uh, be with uh, our friend Pat as she deals with several different issues in her life. One of the reasons that we go to you in prayer, dear Heavenly Father, is, is on behalf of others, that uh, we understand that the prayers of righteous people are rich and powerful. However, we also uh, come before you in thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, what we have and uh, thanks for the blessings of life. And even through, the, through this difficult period uh, in our world with this pandemic, I just pray that you would continue to shine down upon us 
that you would continue to uh, guide us and continue to move us in the right direction. I pray that you would be with us this evening. Uh, help us, dear Heavenly Father, to uh, always want to do your will in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And for our final song this evening, turn to number 477. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. 1 and 3. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Wonderful singing with you, wonderful singing with each other. I uh, pray that the Lord was praised, and the Lord does indeed deserve the praise that uh, we bestow upon him. If you read your bulletins uh, this morning, uh, you probably saw the title of the lesson this evening, that was the greater and the less, and perhaps it maybe piqued your interest uh, wondering what in the world is I'm going to be talking about the greater and the less. And so I'm going to jump right into it with both feet and hope that uh, there's a lesson this morning about some passages that I think are very, very, very familiar, familiar to all of us. And uh, let's just see whether uh, these verses uh, can come alive to us and the lesson will be uh, hopefully inspirational to us. Three or four years ago, a survey was done among, now I use this term, churchgoers. Uh, church uh, goers across the United States were asked this question. Have you heard of the Great Commission? Have you heard of the Great Commission? Shockingly, 51% of the church goers said no. 51%, little over half of church going people had no idea what the Great Commission was. 25% said, well, yeah, I, I, it seems like it's rattling around there somewhere, but uh, I can't remember the exact meaning. 6% said, yeah, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Finally, of the 1,000 people that were queried, only 17% said, yes, this is what it means. 
and went on to explain. And maybe some of them were a even able to go to uh, the scriptures where it is found, which we're going to go to this evening. That wasn't part of the uh, survey as far as I, I understand. So first, let's start this way. The term Great Commission is not found in the Bible. It is just something that we have come to call Jesus' last words that he spoke before he ascended into heaven. It's kind of like the Trinity. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We sang a song, Father, we love you, and so forth. Uh, and Spirit, we love you. Uh, they're members of the Trinity, yet the term Trinity itself is not found in the Bible, even though we understand there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. And so, the Great Commission is a term that's applied, uh, or I should say, to uh, by Jesus, and he gave it to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven. Now, why is it called the Great Commission? All right, I'm going to get sneaky here. Some of you who know your Bibles may, may get this, and you may hearken back to my title, The Great and the Less. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, Jesus already had his apostles, and he sent the 12 apostles out on his personal ministry. He did not accompany them. And the words were this, Matthew 10, 5 to 6. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, we have come to call this the limited commission because the preaching of the gospel was just for Jews. The Great Commission, on the other hand, as we're going to find out in just a moment, uh, is, is much more general and much less specific. Now, it is recorded for us in three of the Gospels. It is recorded in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. Uh, probably the one that is quoted the most is the one in Matthew, and in descending order, then the one in Mark, and finally the least one is Luke. The wording in Luke is quite a bit different than the wording in Matthew and Mark. So let's jump right into Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus began by saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he said, Go therefore and make disciples, get this, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there's that Trinity again, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that's Matthew's version of it. Now Matthew was one of the 12, so he was with Jesus. Uh, Mark and Luke were not with Jesus. But this is Mark's rendition. It's found in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And it goes like this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. A lot of the same wording, little condensed, found in Mark that was found in Matthew. Now, there are a couple of other little things in the Luke version. And again, I told you this one was different than the first two. 
Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And so when we put the three accounts of Jesus' last words together from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get the, the total of the story. And so since we've, we've covered all uh, three of these, let's see exactly what they say and exactly what they tell us. First, we see why it's called the Great Commission. Because in the Matthew version, it says, though therefore make disciples of all nations. It doesn't limit it to the lost of Israel. So it's called the Great Commission because it was not limited. It was to start as the Luke version says, at Jerusalem, and then go from there to all creations beginning at Jerusalem. All right, that's pretty cool in itself, isn't it? Second, the Great Commission, the message that they were to proclaim is the gospel. Now it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you in the Matthew version. In the Mark version, it actually says, go preach to all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. So what they were to do, beginning at Jerusalem, was to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world. Third, let's take a look and see what the, the fundamental facts of the gospel are. Well, the uh, uh, Luke version lets us know this. The Luke version says, it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. All right? And so, uh, and so, uh, thirdly, the, there, there are the, the fundamental facts laid out before us that Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Fourth, it says they were to make disciples of all nations. Now, the 12 were the original disciples. Anyone who believed and did what it said in the Great Commission would become a disciple. Not one of the 12 original, but would become a disciple. And so what did one have to do to become a disciple? Well, it says in the Matthew version, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It also says that in the Mark version, he who has believed and has been baptized will be saved. So, uh, the Luke version says he arose on the third day that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. And so when we baptize people, we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because that's what the Great Commission tells us to do. And before we do that, we know that repentance has to come about. All right? That repentance has to come about. And that 
people are to confess that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And so we get to number five, and I'm, I'm going to kind of retread these, these, these road again. It says, one is baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we have folks going out into all the world, preaching the good news, preaching the gospel, the, the fundamental facts of the gospel. Jesus suffered, rose on the third day. In order to become a disciple, one had to uh, uh, repent and be baptized. However, they had to be baptized specifically into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, you might think, all right, that's a great start, and that is exactly what it is. There's more. At this point, we have our step towards salvation. Sixth says that to become a disciple of Christ, one had to obey all the commands given by Christ. We find that in the Matthew version. It says, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And so disciples are to go out and proclaim the gospel to people as to what has been commanded of them. Now, we didn't have Jesus, but we have this. We have Jesus' Holy Spirit-inspired words. And so, the next step for us and the next step for them is to not just repent, uh, not just to believe, not just to be baptized, but then you have to obey all of the commands. We can't slack. And so the seventh was that those who became disciples were to obey all of the commands, but will go back to the beginning. Here's the great part of the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So after a person has believed after repentance, after baptism, after observing all that Jesus has commanded, we're told to make disciples of all nations. Hmm. Now, there are a couple of other rather interesting little facets mixed in here. Uh, a little time before this, remember, this is found in Matthew 28. In Matthew 24 and verse 15, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, that end was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so he let them know that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. But that first, the gospel would be preached. Now, this was in about 33, 32, 33 AD. Jerusalem was destroyed in 69 to 70 AD. So like 35 or more years. So not only was it preached by the disciples. It was preached by the apostles and by the writing of letters, especially those by Paul and by Peter, by uh, Jesus's brother James, uh, uh, recorded what's recorded for us, written by Luke, uh, the book of Acts. And so what we have here is that the, the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem will come. And that is rather significant. 
Now, in about 62 AD, now this is about 30 years after the words of Jesus here, as far as the Great Commission is concerned. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, and verse 23, compacting it a little bit, Paul says, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. He's saying that by 62 AD, the gospel had been proclaimed. It had been proclaimed to much of the known world. And so the disciples did their job. Now we have one more bit to this, and then the lesson is ours. We live in 2021, give or take about 2,000 years after these words were uttered. About uh, 2,000 or, or just a little less, maybe 50 or 60 years after the apostles wrote what we have recorded for us in our Bibles. With that being said, who is the Great Commission directed toward? All right, go preach the word to all the world. Every generation of Christians has the same responsibility of preaching the gospel to every creature in all nations of the world. Exclamation point. That's your job, and that's my job. And so, every Christian has to look at himself in the mirror, has to do some introspecting, and he or she must ask themselves, what am I doing to carry out the Great Commission? Am I carrying out my role? The apostles did. The apostles did what Jesus had told them to do. And it's up to us some 2,000 years later to do that same thing. And if you're doing that, a great thanks goes out to you. If you are witnessing for the Lord, a great thanks goes to you. Now, you know what? Not all of you can be preachers. And none of us are Holy Spirit inspired the way the apostles were. But nonetheless, we're the only ones on the planet today that can go preach the word to all the world. Oh, folks can read the Bible and find the truth in the Bible. But more than likely, just as Paul says in the Romans, how will people know the word if a preacher doesn't preach it to them? If someone doesn't witness. And even though you might say, well, I'm not a preacher. I can't stand up in front of people. I, I would have much difficulty to, that, to do that. We can all witness for the Lord in our own special way. We can witness for the Lord by showing godliness and holiness in our lives. When people come to know us and that in stressful situations, we're not the ones that curse. We're not the ones that throw our hands up in the air and say, what am I going to do now? We're not the ones that lose patience with people. We're, we're not the ones that try to just write people off as if they don't even belong because Jesus told us to love our enemies. Our part is to go out into all the world, however and whatever that part of the world is. Make our own little part of the world better by witnessing for the Lord in our lives, being the good people that we ought to be. That's when we get our foot in the door, and that's when we can share the gospel with them. 
And we will do our part in going out into all the world and proclaiming the gospel so that people will believe, so that they will repent, so that they will confess and be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we've had a lesson on the great and the less, almost all of it on the great, because the gospel of Jesus is for all nations. I pray that all of us have taken some of this in and uh, think that maybe we need to shoulder some of this responsibility in our lives to be witnesses for the Lord as we spread the gospel. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have you in our lives and we're so grateful that uh, uh, the good news has been proclaimed to us. We're so grateful for your Holy Spirit-inspired words where we find the truths that uh, we need to know and that we need to share with others. Help us to bear the responsibility of being witnesses for you in our life through word and through deed. Continue to be with us. Continue to bless us through the evening. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to think of you as we go to Uh, sleep and think of you as we wake up as our great God. Bless us, be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please stay safe and may God bless you all. Christ the Lord is risen.